Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, my name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. I welcome you once again to another invigorating, uh, information-filled and life-changing episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. I've brought in the chief negotiator of the Botswana government, uh, Mr. Paze Budale, who's going to share with us on uh, issues relating to trade agreements, uh, the vehicle as a vehicle to export-led economic growth. And of course, we're going to touch on my personal favorite, which is Africa Continental Trade Agreement and Trade Area, subject which I'm very passionate about, uh, along with other agreements. Thank you so much for coming to the studio, sir. Thank you, sir. Mm. Uh, I'm so honored that you are here. Would you be kind enough to tell uh, the viewers a little bit of your background, uh, where you st it all started and what you do? Mm. Uh, by, by training, I'm a lawyer. I studied my Bachelor of Laws at the University of Botswana. Then I joined the Botswana government Attorney General's Chambers, where then I was sent for postgraduate uh -huh. to study a Master's of Law mm -hmm. in uh, International Trade Law. And then from there, I was seconded to the, minister, the then Ministry of Trade and Industry where I worked with the negotiating team for Botswana until eventually I was appointed chief negotiator for the Republic of Botswana. When were you so appointed, sir? Around about 2012, I think. Okay. Mm. I um, also have a little bit of background in international trade. My master's degree was an LLM from the University of uh, AU, it was called American University, Washington College of Law, on international trade and banking. That was my specialty. Mm -hmm. But I think the landscape has changed because me, it was in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure by the time you, you did yours, um, the landscape had changed completely. Do you remember what your dissertation was on or what your specialty was on? My dissertation was on competition law and Botswana's access to antiretroviral medicine. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I remember well, yeah, I published a paper. It's in the Journal of the University of Cape Town. Okay, which is where you are studying. That's where I studied for my postgraduate. Okay. Tell, talk to us about the, the office of the chief negotiator. What is the purpose of the office? at the Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry, and what exactly do you do, sir? Mm. Office of the Chief Negotiator was created uh, some years after Botswana joined the World Trade Organization, and uh, specifically, as the, the name of the office suggests, uh, this is a man or woman who will lead the Botswana team in all trade and investment negotiations. And in terms of um, the, the office itself, it's made out of how many people or how is it manned and, 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 and funded? Currently, it's a one-man office, mm -hmm. but supported from different departments of government. Uh, within the Ministry of Investment Trade, we have what we call the Department of International Trade. So they offer the support and secretarial services. But in terms of composition of the Botswana team for trade negotiations, we have the Office of the Attorney General represented, we have the Ministry of Finance represented through the Botswana Unified Revenue Services for customs and rules of origin issues. We have the Ministry of Agriculture represented for issues of sanitary and phytosanitary standards, and indeed for agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And we also have represented the Botswana Bureau of Standards for issues to do with standards and technical barriers to trade. Um, I didn't hear you mention the private sector. I didn't mention you men uh, 
mention, for instance, uh, Business Botswana. Indeed, uh, the private sector make part of our stakeholder consultations, and sometimes they do uh, go with the Botswana team on negotiations, especially for trade and services. Mm -hmm. I don't know why private sector is not as big on trade in goods as opposed to trade in services, because we have the banking association uh, with us, we have from the energy sector, we have uh, the, the players in that sector always in the negotiation team for services. I noticed that in Botswana, lobbying is not, um, is not our forte. I mean, in America, they're very open about lobbying. Do you think perhaps that there is a, a deficiency there uh, where the Botswana's private sector and entrepreneurs have not um, positioned themselves to form lobby groups to, to, to instruct consultancies that can lobby for them? Mm. I think it comes with culture. The area of international trade is rather new to Botswana, and most of the private sector that is in Botswana is inward looking. Uh, barring, for instance, the, the diamond trading, the rest of the private sector has hitherto been inward looking. But with the change in times and with uh, our trade policy now uh, allowing for government to go out there more, mm. I think with uh, the new knowledge in international trade negotiations and what trade agreements mean, then you will start to see more lobby groups. Because at the end of the day, it's not the governments that do business but it's the stakeholders out there in private sector, in non-governmental organization, or what is commonly known as civil society, who at the end of the day, the results of the negotiated agreement uh, uh, are felt more by them than even by Botswana government. Yeah, and, and, and what you're saying is so true because when I completed my master's and I came here to try and position myself as an expert, I, I felt after a while that I was starving. I was having no clients. <laughs> Nobody was coming I think forward. Back then, uh, uh, in the, the 90s. The issue of international trade was alien then. Because mm. Botswana, we joined the WTO, I think, in 1995. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can imagine, there was a lack of capacity, manpower. and But since then, up to now, we, we have made great strides in mm. trying to, to close the gap between us and the developed world. The average entrepreneur may not really know what WTO is. Would you educate us about the role of the WTO and what Botswana's position is in it? Mm. The, the World Trade Organization, I think it came into being after the Second World War because uh, countries felt that they were tired of going to war, and it was realized that the more you trade with somebody, the less likelihood you are going to have to go to war with them. So the, the, the victors of the Second World War to start with uh, came up with the idea of the World Trade Organization, which would promote multilateral trade, which was rule-based, and which was aimed at uh, leveling the playing field out there, which is why there's recognition that the, you have the developed country member states, you have the developing country member states, and indeed the, the least developed member states, mm -hmm. which is why uh, you have differential uh, treatment even within the World Trade Organization so that the playing field can as best as possible be leveled. Okay. Now let's go deeper now and talk about trade agreements. This is the really the um, the brick and mortar of your business and what you do. You deal with trade agreements. Define trade agreements and tell us the important ones for Botswana. In simple terms, uh, trade agreements are what I can call contracts, which in business you, you would call contracts between entrepreneurs, but in international trade, these are contracts between two, two or more countries. Mm. Now, the trade agreement will contain all the rules and regulations that will govern the, the trade dealings between two or more member states. But uh, by way of structuring, uh, international agreement, trade agreements, will consist of the broad legal text, mm -hmm. which uh, lays down the principles to be agreed and the modalities 
And then when you go further down, you have what is called uh, tariff schedules, mm -hmm. which will record the agreed uh, trade concessions mm -hmm. or tariff uh, removal between the contracting parties. You also have what is called rules of origin. Now, rules of origin are rules that determine the origin of a product. Uh, say, uh, uh, Republic of Mr. Mohove and Republic of Mr. Bitale enter into a trade agreement. Yes. There has to be play rules which will confer origin to say uh, a product originates from Mohove Republic. Mm. It has to meet one, two, three uh, legal uh, requirements. Mm. And then you also have, as part of a uh, trade agreement, what is called NTBs or non tariff barriers. And all trade agreements are geared towards liberalizing trade through removal of tariffs, through agreeing pre agreed rules of origin that are predictable, mm. and indeed removing non tariff barriers mm. to trade. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you talk of tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers. Can you give examples of those? Tariff barriers are customs duties. Mm. Say if uh, the Republic of Botswana, a company in the Republic of Botswana wants to export beef mm. to Kenya, for example, yes. they will charge a duty of maybe 30%. Mm. But in a, if we have a preferential trade agreement with uh, Kenya, this duty will be negotiated away to say, no, if you bring your beef here, it can come in duty free with no duty being charged mm. now with ntbs mm. ntbs come in many forms usually in laws and regulations mm. so ahead of time in a trade agreement we agree that uh, we are going to have standard rules applicable say for customs for transportation of goods so that there are no surprises mm. you know that when your cargo leaves botswana it will arrive in harare in zimbabwe without having encountered these uh, restrictive uh, rules, uh, NTBs. Mm. Okay, very, very interesting. What is the difference between bilateral and multilateral trade agreements? Uh, by so perhaps you need to define each. Mm. Mm. A bi meaning two. Mm. A bilateral agreement is an agreement between two parties. Mm -hmm. Now the parties can be an individual state as Botswana or a customs union like SACU, which consists of a number of states. So the party on the SACU side will be SACU, mm. meaning the five member states of SACU. And if we are going In other words, they're, they're, they're an entity that can sue and be sued in, in, in indeed, themselves. Absolutely, indeed. Mm. And on the other side, maybe you will have the United States of America mm. as another party. So that is called a bilateral. Mm -hmm. And then uh, moving from there, you have what is called a plurilateral agreement, meaning uh, you have a multiplicity of parties. Same maybe thing as multilateral? Not quite. Oh, I see. Uh, maybe more than two parties but not as many as 147 of the WTO. Mm. So you might have, uh, an example will be the tripartite free trade area agreement in Africa, mm. where the parties are the SADC states, mm -hmm. the East African community states, and the COMESA, common market for East and Southern Africa states. So that is a plurilateral. Mm -hmm. And then now when you move to a multilateral agreement, Mm. That's when you have a real multiplicity of parties, like for example, the African Free Trade, Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Yes. That is an example of a multilateral agreement where mm. you have 55 member states as parties. Or indeed the WTO. Uh, the WTO, in fact, is the flagship of mm. the multilateral agreements where mm. you have uh, over or close, well, there are about 147 parties to That's that That's a agreement. lot. Yes. Mm. But it's still not the, all the countries of the world, right? Uh, no, but the very few are remaining outside because the, the latest of the big economies to join the WTO is China. And mm -hmm. they did that, I think, in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now that we understand the differences between the different laterals, if I can call them that, uh, from the point of view of Botswana, which ones are most important and which ones are you most mindful of as the chief negotiator? 
I think uh, all the agreements are important, but looking at the history and the impact on the direct impact on the economy of Botswana, I think the first and foremost for Botswana is the SACU agreement for mm -hmm. the customs union because uh, we get 30% of our national budget annually from SACU revenues. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, SACU not the most important, but the mm. most significant. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Just I know what you mean, it. yeah. Yes. Mm. But uh, all the agreements are, are very useful for Botswana. Then you have the SADC trade protocol, which uh, sought to liberalize trade in SADC, where as SACU, Botswana being a member of the customs union, we have liberalized almost 90% of our tariff lines. What does that mean? Reduced? It means we have re removed mm. uh, customs duty on 90% of the products in our tariff book. For, for all the countries? For all the SADC member mm. states. Uh, and then we have the tripartite, and then now recently we have the AFCFTA, mm. which will now involve all the member states of the African Union. But still, uh, we have agreements outside of Africa, uh, most notably the Economic Partnership Agreement with the European Union, mm. which we concluded as SACU and Mozambique, mm -hmm. now making six member states of SADC. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important for Botswana because traditionally, our market for beef has been the European Union. Yes. And then we also have as SACU now, we have an agreement with the Nordic states of the European Free Trade Association. I think it's Norway, Iceland, Finland, and Switzerland. Uh, so that too is a, another market for Bozana for beef, mm. which we have uh, tried to explore to the fullest, even though it's not as satisfying as we would like yes. due to productive capacity constraints on our side. Mm. But all these agreements are very important to us. Mm. Mm. Now you've answered me very well, but uh, there is a perception, whether it's correct or, or wrong, in the SACU context, that South Africa sometimes plays like big brother and sometimes occasionally bullies the other smaller countries. Is there any basis for this perception? Indeed, there is a basis for the perception which led to the revision of the SACU agreement in 2002 to try and democratize decision making mm. by putting in place institutions like the tribunal to deal with disputes between member states and most notably the tariff board which will be responsible for tariff setting, tariff administration, investigations because tariffs are a tool towards industrial development. And hitherto, the mandate for that tariff board has been, uh, in the interim, handed to the Republic of South Africa. Up to 2002? Beyond, even up to today. Oh. Because now we are trying to operationalize the tariff board and we have encountered resistance. Maybe it was before we had a strong chief negotiator like you. No, how, no, how could we all, agree? We've how always we, had strong how could we agree to <laughs> How could we agree to have South Africa dominate to that extent? No, I think then it was an issue of lack of capacity. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing like earlier I said when we joined the WTO. We didn't have experts in international trade negotiations and the like. So South Africa has been uh, an advanced developing country since time immemorial. Mm. So they had these uh, uh, tariff administration body called ITEC, mm. which had been there. So it was only logical to say, for now, can ITEC do, carry out the mandate for the rest of SACU? But now we since have the Botswana Trade Commission, we have trained people to do the work on tariffs and safeguards and other countervailing measures. Now we are saying it's time now to operationalize the tariff board and to have a democratically operating Southern African Customs Union. And when is that likely to happen? We have been on the issue now for four years, and we hope in the not too distant future, we, we shall have a mutually acceptable resolution on how we are going to move forward. 
with the Sakutaru board. What is the major stumbling block? Why is it dragging? It's dragging because uh, all of a sudden they, somebody realizes that the big brother mentality, 90% plus of the industry in Saku is located within South Africa. Mm. That's my honest view. Now, for them to relinquish. relinquish the power to determine tariffs, the power to, because like I was saying, it's tariff management is intrinsically linked to industrial development. Mm -hmm. And that would mean they are seeding also some of the industrial base. Mm -hmm. So it's not an easy decision, but you would wonder why in 2002, they agreed and signed on to mm. the agreement. And do we think we have any leverage as the smaller countries to actually get Big Brother to move on on that point? Or is it just a matter of um, we are totally at their mercy? No, 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 we are not at their mercy at all. We do have the leverage. Uh, I think uh, a mutually acceptable solution will be reached. Mm. Mm. Let's remain hopeful. Where we and the rest of the smaller economies within SACU will have a say in decision making. Because at the end of the day, the government of Botswana is responsible to the citizenry mm. on what we get and what we lose from SACU. Has a lopsided arrangement led, not led to stunted development of our industries also? It has. Uh, unfortunately, you have like I mentioned earlier, the revenue, it's tangible. You can see it, you can touch it. Mm. But the opportunity cost of the lost uh, advancement in industrial development, you cannot cost it or see it with the naked eye. Mm. So it's always a, a balancing act. And the revenue collection within government, the tax collector, Minister of Finance, mm. will always lean towards we have guaranteed revenue, 30%. but us as the custodians of industry are saying, but there's an opportunity cost here. Mm. You can seed some of the revenue and then make sure that you grow the industrial base, which in turn is going to grow the tax base. Mm. So it's a debate that I hope uh, you are winning, Mr. Butali. We are working with our counterparts and hopefully soon we will have a way forward. Okay. How do all these uh, multilateral and bilateral re agreements relate to industrial development policy? And in a nutshell, what is actually our industrial development policy? Are you able to define it? Yes, we have an industrial development policy that was adopted by Botswana government, I think, uh, in the early 2010s. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, it's 2012. Uh, in this policy, we have uh, prioritize five sectors uh, being manufacturing, being agro-processing, uh, and other services related mm. to these. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have them at the top of my head. Mm. But th these are where we thought as Botswana we have uh, comparative advantage and we had opportunity to grow in those areas. Mm. So those are our priorities. So now, what is the link between the industrial policy and the trade agreement? Mm -hmm. When we go out to negotiate trade, mm. we look at our priorities, and as far as possible, we try and get a market for these five priority sector products. And with that, you know, because a, a market from a trade agreement is as good as a promissory note. Mm -hmm. mm. So you can, in fact, attract investors based on what you have on paper in a trade agreement. Mm. I think uh, the examples are within SACU, because we have free trade within SACU. Yes. Then you have the big uh, automotive industry in South Africa. Botswana was able to attract uh, companies from Europe to manufacture harnesses for the South African uh, auto market. Mm -hmm. So you see how the, the mm, linkage is still going on. Value chain. Yeah. It's going on and year by year uh, I'm glad to say that it's growing. Mm. Mm. Okay. And then um, still on the question of industrial policy, um, the, the biggest debate has been that we're really not participating enough in the value chain. Uh, that we appear at the A and at the Z, but in the middle 
In other words, insofar as providing raw goods uh, or raw products, you know, that's where we are good at, rough diamonds for argument's sake. And then we only feature when it comes to, you know, the actual consumption of those products. And this is a criticism for all of Africa, and to some extent is an impetus for the AFCTA. How does this, our industrial policy, address the value chain dilemma for Africa and for Botswana? Yeah, I think this dilemma uh, carries on from uh, the colonial legacy. I think uh, the colonial masters were smart enough to, to take raw materials from Africa to be processed and to develop industry, particularly in Europe. I think that the same thing still preve prevails more even in West Africa, mm. where until recently they only denounced uh, the franc as a, a currency for Even that is still a fight, isn't it? Yes. That they haven't totally... Yes. Mm. So you cannot totally divorce economic development from the colonial past, but mm. the AFCFTA is a, a huge step and milestone towards finally attempting to liberate uh, Africa from the claws of Europe, America, and Asia mm. by saying, let us trade amongst ourselves. Let us sh uh, share the raw materials amongst ourselves so that we export uh, finished product from Africa at greater returns. Mm. So even uh, at the level of Botswana, that has been our realization, which is why we indeed reviewed uh, the industrial development policy. Has, and has it been incorporated, this notion? The, sa the same ideas that are in AFTA, have they been incorporated into our policy as a country? They have, and indeed they have been incorporated into SADC and SAG. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in SADC we have the industrial development framework, uh, which was approved by a summit in 2015 in Harare, if I recall. Now, in terms of that, we are saying let us maximize on uh, creating cross-border value chains within the region so that we are able to produce finished product within the region mm. and export it as opposed to each one of us exporting raw material and all of us importing finished product from Europe, America and Asia. It requires um, each identifying their strengths and seeing which one we can agree on. Yeah. So what is Botswana's perceived strength and what can Botswana be exporting in this regard? We are looking at manufacturing, agro-processing. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we have skins and hides because mm. we do cattle. Botswana is supposedly a cattle country. It so is. we are looking at uh, playing in the value chain for mm. creating uh, cattle seeds not cattle seeds, for leather seeds mm. for the South African auto industry. Yes. So in that way, you see the, the value chains and the linkages. And uh, further, in Botswana, we are looking at more uh, processing our beef instead of just uh, exporting our beef uh, raw to the European Union. But we need to add value mm. from source so that we, we generate enough to be able to sustain the, the cattle sector. Because for now, we are told by the Minister of Agriculture that the national herd has deteriorated in numbers mm. compared to maybe 20, 30 years ago. Mm. The problem is that there has not been enough returns from market to reach the most important people who are the farmers and mm. producers of beef. And the source. Mm. What do you say to the cynics and the skeptics who say, look, we can't even produce toothpicks, much less shoes and leather seats and all those things. People are saying they don't see it happening. Can you as a chief negotiator help us see the vision? Hey, the, the economy, uh, like the world, mm -hmm. evolves. It's not static. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in 1980, uh, there were no plastic tubes manufactured in Botswana. But when you talk today, we have some of the most competitive manufacturers of plastic tubes. Uh, and indeed... Uh, and Jojo's, eh? And Jojo's. <laughs> the, the government of the Republic of Botswana continues to put in place measures to mm. try and assist budding industries, be it by way of infant industry protection, where you levy duty, 
mm. on the product that you are trying to nurture the industry in, or indeed by coming up with uh, quantitative restrictions, mm. but within the rules of the WTO, SADC and SACU. Example will be bottled water. Uh, we used to import bottled water from everywhere in the world, mm. but now we have restricted the import of bottled water and you see many bottling companies uh, have emerged. come up, mm. they have emerged. Mm. Uh, likewise, it's with salt. The raw material for salt is mined in Botswana, but we used to export the raw salt and import the finished product packaged salt. But since we've had quantitative restriction on imports, now you have more packaging and uh, salt processing companies set up Do you have actually Botswana. salt companies in Botswana that sell salt? Yes. Uh -huh. You should check the packaging of the salt you buy in pick and pay, choppies. Mm. All of it is made in Botswana. Wow. Mm. That's very good. And then in terms of uh, other industries, which where we are, I've heard that we're doing well with, uh, with bubble gum. Is that true? We did for some time, but uh, not only bubble gum, but chocolate and sweets uh, and other such goods. But because of some of the restrictive rules within SACU, which we are trying to amend, uh, you could produce the bubble gum and chocolate here, but the rules say you cannot sell them back into South Africa, which defeats any sense of logic because South Africa within SACU is the biggest market mm. for the rest of How us. How could we have so agreed to such rules? 1966. Mm. <laughs> but it's something that we are actively working to, to So reverse. what happened to Steamroll that was manufacturing at uh, um, you know, Commerce Park there? I read somewhere that they were, they, they were importing the most amount of bubble gum. They've stopped? I think that the company we had was Cadbury's. Yeah, I know I that so. it had to fold because of the problem that I, I have had to now. Mm. Mm. And, and really, uh, what, 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 what do, how have we positioned ourselves now? Do manufacturers and investors see ourselves as an attractive, uh, as an attractive place for, for industry? Perhaps you could address this in the context of special economic zones mm. as well. Absolutely, because uh, Botswana is, uh, by a stroke of luck, positioned right in the middle of southern Africa. Mm. W what we don't have by way of access to the sea, we have by way of positioning, which allows us to become the transport and logistics hub in the whole of southern Africa. Mm. Such that, uh, and because politically and uh, labor relations wise, Botswana is considered one of the most, if not the most stable in Southern Africa. A lot of companies would rather uh, locate in Botswana than, for example, South Africa, where the labor relations are up and down. Mm. And uh, now, having realized that, we decided to come up with a spe special economic zones policy, which then graduated to a law. And indeed, we have designated eight sites uh, in eight regions for special economic zones because we realize that the positioning of Botswana allows us to, to nurture and harness uh, relations in those sectors to be able to serve the rest of Africa going north. What are these zones and what do they really offer the manufacturer? In lay terms, <coughs> special economic zones are export processing zones. So ideally, all the produce in special economic zones is for export outside of Botswana. So because of this fact, uh, to attract the right caliber of industry to set up in these special economic zones, we have to give them incentives, uh, be it tax incentives, uh, the income tax in special economic zones, I think it's set from 5 to 10 percent, while the normal income tax, okay, for manufacturing outside the zones could be 15 percent, but a normal company that's not in manufacturing is 25 percent. And then we also, as government, say, okay, come, if you set up in a special economic zone and uh, like spade you, and you produce some of the goods that we may require, we will guarantee to buy 30% of, 
or offtake, what's called an offtake agreement for 30% of your produce. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned Spedu, that's just one, Spedu in Pique. What are the yeah, others? We, we have eight. In mm. Khabaroni, we have the financial park and fairgrounds mm -hmm. where you're going to have uh, financial institutions dealing offshore, mm -hmm. not providing services locally. Mm -hmm. uh, your ABN, Amro Bank, mm. your other uh, insurance companies, they will be set up there. In fact, these are already there under the IFSC. Mm -hmm. uh, structure. Which has been there for a long time. Yes. Mm. Then we have the Ceseret Zakama International Airport Special Economic Zones. Mm. That's basically for manufacturing. Where exactly is that? It's around the airport. Near, near, the, near yeah. the, the um, Botswana Innovation Hub. Yes. Mm. You see the development that's going there of the primary infrastructure. It's for the Special Economic Zone. Mm. So uh, in our vision, we foresee a lot of activity in that area. You're going to have the special economic zone, and then uh, sub, uh, in parallel, you also have what they call the airport city, mm -hmm. where you'll have the big hotels, the malls, everything there. Mm. And then uh, in Francistown, we have designated the transport and logistics special economic zone looking at the north, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Democratic Republic of Congo, even as far as uh, Tanzania. Mm. Then uh, in the Panda Matenga, we have an agricultural special economic zone mm. agro for agro-processing, mm -hmm. because that is where we have most of our, farm, of our farms there. And already a huge outlay of investment has gone in there to build silos for mm. the produce that's coming out from there. Mm. Uh, we are on four. Then you have Spedu, uh, Selimi Pique, Spedu, yes. uh, which is the other one. We have eight in total. You have eight in total. Mm. And essentially, when you're just, you have to break it down from uh, my entrepreneurial friends, with the viewing public. When you are qualified, what does it take to qualify and exactly what do you get if mm. you are established at an um, SEZ? The kind of companies that go there intended to be huge capital investment uh, to bring uh, employment creation and to be able to export mm -hmm. so to do that obviously you need to have the capacity both uh, technical wise and uh, financial wise mm -hmm. so really we are looking at big companies which the SMEs mm -hmm. Botswana SMEs can piggyback on to have these to explore and exploit the market pro presented by the AFCFTA, by AGOA, and by uh, the European Union Economic Partnership Agreement. Mm. Now, a live example that I like to give is this one. Because the United States of America does not have a preferential trade agreement, a bilateral, with the European Union, mm -hmm. they had to, both the European Union and the United States, had to set up the auto industry in South Africa. So if you look carefully, you have the European models of VW, Mercedes, and BMW being produced in South Africa for export to the United States mm -hmm. under AGOA, mm -hmm. because they, they will be charged no duty. Mm. But if BMW tried to export from Germany to the United States, mm -hmm. the duties are prohibitive. Mm. Likewise, for the United States, you have Ford, uh, for the line of Ford Ranger in South Africa, mm -hmm. built specifically for export to the European Union. Mm -hmm. So you see now how the, the trade agreements become mm -hmm. currency for, for entrepreneurs. And uh, these industries in South Africa are basically special economic zones. Mm -hmm. Yes, because mm -hmm. they are there for export mm -hmm. to okay. the US and EU market. So mm. in a way, we look to... Is it predominantly for, for export or totally and there's no local consumption? For ours, we have made provision for local consumption, but mm. only where the product produced in the special economic zone is not produced anywhere in our economy. So it's very rare to find that exception. Mm. Mm. Very, very interesting. Trade in services and export of services from BW. Um, you may have touched on this earlier, but I, I just want you to really paint the picture and perhaps you could even bring in Agoa um, 
to help us understand those services and 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 uh, you know goods and services that we are able to trade um, through 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 these uh, these agreements, especially Agoa, because Agoa, I think, for an average entrepreneur, is still a, is still a mystery. Mm. Agoa is mainly for manufactured goods. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, with the economic partnership agreement, we have a gentleman's agreement to move from goods to negotiating trade and services. We are not there yet. Mm -hmm. But in the AFCFTA, we have negotiated a trade and services agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, we have agreed to prioritize five priority services sector. Uh, some of which are in uh, financial services, non-banking, insurance, uh, micro-lending and the mm. like. Mm. Uh, we have agreed to negotiate liberalization of telecommunications so that our B-Mobile, if it grows the capability and capacity enough, can play in the Nigerian market and benefit from the over 150 million uh, population yes. in Nigeria. And that's conservative, mm. by the way. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, we have agreed to negotiate uh, construction services, which you, you play in, yeah, <laughs> property yeah. development. Yes. I know one of our Botswana companies, I think it's Tanstar Holdings, mm. they have investments in Tanzania. Yes. Uh, so by negotiating trade and services is to make it easy for entrepreneurs playing in the real estate space to mm. be able to expand their footprint to mm -hmm. the rest of Africa. That's in, uh, that's in regard to FCTA? Yes. Yeah. And then we have NSADEC. NSADEC, okay. And then we have uh, for professional services, which you also play in as mm -hmm. a practicing attorney, mm. uh, for architects, for medical practitioners, we try to say, okay, let's allow uh, Africans to practice mm. in Africa. Mm. So th this is by way of liberalizing and creating uh, homogeneous or uh, one market mm. for Africa. Mm. Mm. But the, I'm worried about the timetables we've set ourselves, which is 34 years. Now speaking specifically about the AFCTA, 34 years seems to be a very long time before we have complete integration. Yeah, it seems to be a long time, but uh, in actual fact, it's not. Mm. Looking at the fact that we, we have been under colonial uh, rule for a decade or decades. <laughs> now, Hundreds of years. The, yeah. the, the AFCFTA, the mm. catch is here. It's mm. made of three pillars. Mm. The market integration, which is the trade in goods and trade in services. Mm. That's easy to do. Mm. But to be able to trade in these, you need the infra necessary infrastructure. We know Africa has been plagued by war and to, mm. to get a cargo from Cape Town by rail to Egypt is almost impossible because mm. when you reach Angola and DRC, there is no, absolutely none, mm. the rail infrastructure. Mm. And then you have the industrial development pillar, mm. which says for you to trade uh, in manufactured goods, mm. you need the necessary capacity and uh, capital to mm -hmm. be able to produce. So I think that is why in their wisdom, the heads of state set a timetable of, uh, what's it called? Agenda 2063. So yeah. that in 2063, we should have all the three pillars running in unison mm -hmm. so that trade in Africa can yes. actually uh, proceed and okay. hindered. Now, speaking specifically of the a AFCTA, uh, when I last checked, last time you and I, we appeared on the I show, at the time it was 34 countries that had ratified, and Botswana wasn't among them. As the chief negotiator, what is the problem? I am screaming for ratification, and in my view, it is taking too long. Mm. For, I don't know, the Botswana, we have a different system from the other member states who are able to ratify. Uh, for Botswana to ratify, we have to justify to all stakeholders, to government, to the private sector, what uh, value proposition we are getting from an agreement. Mm. And where we are now, we are not as, at a stage to justify the value proposition for the simple fact that we have not concluded negotiations on tariffs. We have submitted 
draft tariff of us. Likewise, Egypt has, likewise, uh, ECOWAS have. But we have the principle of reciprocity. Now, looking at the draft of us, they don't wait the same. Mm. So what you do, you sit down across the table to negotiate. You either calibrate going up or down so that the offer you are giving me is of similar weight. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's a very delicate exercise. Mm. But we hope that uh, because we have existing trade agreements with SADC and the East African community, if we can get uh, Egypt to agree with SACU, Botswana being part of SACU, mm. on the tariff uh, preferences, mm. we will be able to come back to private sector and say, this is what we got from our negotiations. These are the pros, these are the cons, and in the final analysis, we think we are going to get a net benefit from this. Mm. And then they can give the go ahead, then we go to government to say, the private sector is happy with what we have negotiated, now can we go ahead and ratify. That is where Botswana is, well, and we hope that the work will be concluded by the AU summit of June, such that by then Botswana will have ratified the agreement, and the private sector can so basically you're talking trading. about two or three months two or three months mm, that's encouraging but still still on that point but other countries and you mentioned egypt you mentioned nigeria if i'm not mistaken they've ratified but they're busy negotiating those tariffs Which that, why, why should you put the cut before the horse negotiation before the ratification that's why I said the processes might be different. For Botswana, you have to justify the value proposition. Is that by law? By internal process, mm -hmm. yes. Which we cannot do if we don't have mm -hmm. agreed mm -hmm. uh, and negotiated tariff concession. Okay. Mm. Like, that notwithstanding, the member states who have ratified are not trading mm. because there are no agreed tariff schedules. So nope. they are not trading under the AFCFTA. But I believe that their experts and their consultants are positioning themselves. Likewise, uh, Botswana, we are trying to raise awareness for mm. the private sector to say, get ready for the time when we, we ratify. Mm. You are able to send products to Egypt and to mm. Kenya and all of them. The easiest thing which you might be defining as a low-hanging fruit is uh, things like visas, you know, taking them out as, as potential non-tariff barriers. Um, in your judgment, which, which visas are likely to go first and how soon are business people going to be able to travel in the length and breadth of Africa looking for opportunities under the, the AFCTA? Frankly, I have no idea. But mm. within SADC, I can tell you that our ministry responsible for visas is actively working at this univisa thing, mm. where especially for tourists and business people within the SADC region, uh, when somebody is coming to Zambia and they want to come to Botswana, they apply just for one visa, mm -hmm. which is called a univisa, so they can move around the region. Yeah. But as for Africa, I think the, the agreement is still a long way off, but the, there's political will that there must be free movement of particularly business persons within Africa. Mm -hmm. Now the difficulty becomes where uh, we've had civil strife in Africa. I think our foreign affairs department, mm -hmm. uh, that's where they have difficulty. Uh, to say let's open for Angola, let's open for DRC. Not that I'm saying Angola and DRC, um, they are our beloved brothers, but mm. because of the history... I thought Angola is 100% peaceful now. Yes, but uh, there will be people who are blacklisted for security reasons and all mm. of that. Mm. Mm. But Angola is even, we don't require a visa for Angolans to come here, but they require visas for us to go there. Okay, so, it's, so ah. it has to be reciprocal. Yes. So then it should be done within yes. the, the SADC so, context. Yeah, we are going to negotiate that as part of the trading services. Mm. In SADC now, Angola was slow to come to the party, but they have shown movement recently that they want to join the SADC protocol on trading goods. Mm. They've made their draft offer, and likewise, they have ratified the trading services. So mm. we'll have to sit down and negotiate mm. their services schedule. They always say that uh, the devil is in the detail. And in this regard, I've had people express concerns about 
consumer protection, and then I've had people com co express concern about competition. What is there in the, uh, in the agreement AFCTA to address these two co areas of concern? And in terms of the detail of the agreement, what can you tell us? There's not much on uh, consumer protection, but on unfair trade practices, yes, there is something. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the trick is here, is that as uh, partner states, mm -hmm. how do we address cross-border competition issues? How do we address cross-border consumer protection issues? I think uh, our con competition and consumer protection agents they have uh, live MOUs with our sister agencies in South Africa and uh, Namibia. Now, in the context of the AFCFTA, mm. I think we have to caution business people uh, willing to participate. Because, okay, the AFCFTA comes with noble and good intentions, mm. but obviously there's the bad side. Mm. There will always be sharks. Mm. Now, <laughs> therein comes the issue of trade financing, the issue of insurance, the issue of how do you In protect other words, your risk cargo. mitigation. Yes, the risk mitigation. Mm. So it's very important for entrepreneurs who intend uh, taking part in the AFCFTA and doing business with our brothers in Africa to make sure that they take risk mitigation as number one priority. Lack of awareness in terms of the average man in the street is still a problem. And I was invited to a local radio station where I suggested perhaps we need to go on a road tour. Our government needs to consider that, taking people like yourself and maybe the appropriate minister on a road tour, even addressing quota meetings to conscientize the people about the AFCTA and the likely impact thereof. Do you think that was a, a good idea or a terrible idea? It was a good idea. In fact, it's something that we are implementing. Mm -hmm. the, the ministers are on constituency week now. Mm. They go there and disseminate. But the, the, the problem has been COVID. Now COVID has restricted workshops, seminars. Even so quarter meetings. Yes. Mm. As far as possible now, we are trying to migrate from the conventional to the new normal where we try and do these online and virtual. Mm. But the, the idea is Can you have a virtual quota meeting? Not necessarily <laughs> a quota meeting, but a virtual workshop mm. for entrepreneurs all over Botswana mm -hmm. that we can do. But a quota meeting by <laughs> definition can only be in person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what <laughs> yeah. I believe. Yeah. So in fact, you have something in the offing and how soon can we have some of these virtual meetings to educate the public about the AFCTA? Yeah, already in partnership with the AFCFTA with SACU, I think you participated in one of the forum, or you yes. are going to participate? Were you one of the people on that call? I, well, I recommended you. In yes, fact. okay, thank you. <laughs> so we try. Yes. Uh, okay. As far as possible, there's this program, Africa What? Yeah, mm. uh, on the international trade that goes on mm. but we are going to step up or ramp up our efforts to try and mm. publicize and raise awareness okay mm. economic partnership agreement between SADC and eu you mentioned it but is there a sense in which some of these original agreements are going to fall off once the afct comes on full steam no they are not gonna fall off but they will run concurrently because when we negotiated the AFCFTA, there was a realization that you have these regional agreements. Mm. So one of the principles agreed was this. Uh, we have a SADC protocol on trade. Mm -hmm. So the parties to the SADC protocol on trade continue trading under that protocol mm. so that we don't have to renegotiate at the AFCFTA. Mm. So as SACU, when we get to the AFCFTA, we are only negotiating with those parties whom we do not have preferential trade agreements with, mm. which is why I keep mentioning Egypt, mm -hmm. the East African community, though we have an arrangement under the tripartite, which is still to enter into force. Mm. And lastly, ECOWAS. Those will be our priorities to conclude the preferential trade terms under the AFCFT. Mm. Let's talk about the Far East um, and how China, Japan, and perhaps even, you know, um, 
uh, Taiwan and others feature in the AFCTA because I mean, you have to admit that they are consuming huge quantities of our raw materials. No, definitely. Now, with the advent of the AFCFTA, mm. you are going to see a lot of companies from Asia, from Europe and America establishing on the African continent so that they can benefit from the raw materials and indeed from the rules of origin so that they enjoy the preferential terms of the AFCFTA. Mm. So year by year you will see more foreign direct investment coming into our special economic zones. Uh, it's good for Botswana by that uh, they will create employment and increase the tax base and hopefully partner with Botswana to create empowerment for citizens. Is there a downside? Is there areas that you're concerned about, especially on the Far East? The downside will be transshipment. <laughs> mm. But uh, what do you mean? Explain to the viewer what you mean. Transshipment is like passing off, mm. uh, bringing finished product to Botswana and labeling it as Botswana good. Mm. So for that to avert that, you need very stringent customs rules and procedures mm. to guard against transshipment. Mm. So that if those companies want to manufacture here, it must be genuine manufacturing. If they are going to get raw material from China, yes, then they add value in Botswana. Uh, in accordance with the agreed rules of origin, those will determine if uh, looking at the, the value add, the product, product qualifies as originating from Botswana. Two things I want to ask you about, skills transfer and um, any protection in terms of ensuring that shareholding is local, local is, lo is there any effort, not quite indigenization, but making sure that indigenous people have a share in these companies and skills are transferred? That, that's my two-pronged question. I think you understand what I'm saying. Yes, mm. indeed. Uh, government is going towards uh, empowering citizens. Mm. We have the citizen empowerment policy. Now we're trying to migrate it to law. By mm. now we should have presented it to Parliament, mm. but there's a legal hurdle, uh, which takes you right back to the Constitution of Botswana, mm. who qualifies as a citizen. Because where you are coming from, like most other Botswana, uh, is to say, let's empower indigenous citizens. Mm. But the Constitution does not uh, differentiate citizens between indigenous and new generation citizens. Mm, no, so it doesn't. Like all the, constitutions worldwide. The big elephant in the room. Mm. Mm. Because, um, because you are asking, if the question that arises is that should we be looking at constitutional amendment? Is it important enough politically? For the past 20 years, we've been talking constitutional amendment. But to amend the constitution, Mm. There must be a pressing need, mm. not, not only for citizen empowerment, but it must be holistic. Mm. So I think uh, before there will be a referendum, if there hasn't been any, mm. to say, is it now time to touch the sacred document that the Constitution, to try and mend it to aid Botswana in going forward. Mm. And that, that is a decision that can only be taken by the citizen. And what's the personal opinion of our chief negotiator in that regard? that the objective test must be, is there a need to amend the constitution? And if uh, the evidence on the ground dictates that there is a need, then I'll be in support of a constitutional review. I'm with you, I'm with you. Um, you've answered most of my questions, now it's your turn to hit me with one question. We have the, these opportunities from all these trade agreements and you being an entrepreneur and a player, specifically in the real estate, what are your challenges? What would you like the government to stand up and assist mm. uh, you and those of similar ilk to try and benefit from these markets that we have? It's a good point. It's a good question. I think what you are doing in Rabutal is very commendable because here now government is engaged in the private sector, taking advantage of technology to advise us about these things. You'll agree with me up to now there has not been really a conscious effort to disseminate information, to really involve the private sector. Yes, we had the HLCC, 
um, which was a mechanism for interaction between the private sector and government. But even that, I think, has been put on hold, whether it's because of COVID or other reasons, I don't know. So I think my attitude is that, look, transparency, openness, that's what we need to work on. But I do see uh, low-hanging fruit uh, in terms of uh, the industries that I'm operating in. Um, I mentioned to you during the, the I interview that construction, construction is one area where we have the skills, we have very successful construction companies. I um, hope I'm not being arrogant when I say our company, Mogobe Incorporated, is one such successful construction company. And uh, we have seen uh, on YouTube uh, an, inst an instance where a Gambian gentleman went and created huge w housing estates. I don't know whether you've I seen it. it. It went viral it. Yes. in Nigeria. There's nothing to stop us replicating what Borre, um, Jamali through Universal Builders have done here in Khaboroni and us now doing it uh, internationally where perhaps the population base is stronger, perhaps where um, it's easier to source certain materials, mm -hmm. uh, things like cement. This, uh, so I see a lot of opportunities, but I also love traveling. I also love international traveling. I'm just hoping that once the scourge of COVID subsides and, and the fear of COVID subsides with the vaccines and everything will open up literally. So the idea of now being for the first time in uh, decades, being able to interact with my African sisters and brothers, other business people, mm -hmm. as a result of this agreement, to me, that in itself is a low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. But if out of that partnerships and other deals can come out, I'm very, very excited. So. Uh, you see me talking on social media about this. Yeah. You see me talking on radio about this. It's something about which I'm very, very excited. And I really appreciate what you are doing, Re Butali. Mm -hmm. People like you, what they are doing in terms of sacrificially. Because to some extent, when you're working for government, there's an element of sacrifice. Volunteer. Yeah. You're <laughs> sacrificially giving of yourselves yeah. so that you can empower the society, the community in which you live. So to me, uh, that's, that's also something that is commendable for which I thank you. Mm. Oh, it's my pleasure, sir. Mm. I hope I've answered your question. You did. Okay. You did. Look at that, that screen there, that camera, mm. and tell that person looking at us, um, final inspirational words, talk about Agoa, talk about AFTA, talk about special economic zones, and wrap it all up in one last message. Mm. Just to say to... Uh, people, especially in the private sector, uh, the opportunities abound in these trade agreements. Feel free to come to the ministry and ask, because information is power. And to the youth, uh, do go into second generation business. Explore sectors that have hitherto not been explored in technology and, uh, yeah, because apparently we now live in the, the new, new world order. Adapt your business. Do not be afraid to go out there and take risks so that at the end of the day we are able to grow the economy of Botswana in leaps and bounds away from uh, diamonds and mining. That's my parting shot for today. Thank you very much. If somebody wants to engage with you, would you care to give your contact numbers and contact details for the benefit yes, of the viewer? Yes, call the Ministry of Investment, Trade and Industry on plus 267-3601-260 and ask for Mr. Vitali. Then they will send you direct to my office. Any, any connection on social media and other platforms? I'm uh, on email tbutale at icloud.com. I'm on Twitter at M A H A T S E. And you can also uh, hit the government ministry Twitter page. I think it's at M I T I. Thank you very much for taking off uh, your valuable time to come and talk to us. We've really enriched us this afternoon. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Ramahul. Thank